In this video, we're going to be looking at the similarities and some differences between Biblical Aramaic and Biblical Hebrew. So this is a certain type of Aramaic and a certain type of Hebrew that come to us through the Hebrew Bible. In fact, if you open up to the books of Ezra or Daniel, that's where you're going to find the 99.9% .9 of Aramaic in the Bible that's contained in the Hebrew Bible. The Hebrew edition of the Bible actually has some Aramaic chunks. And it's a great way to compare the two languages. They are like cousin languages. It's like maybe maybe you could think of Spanish and Italian, Spanish and French, uh, German and Dutch, maybe even as close as Norwegian and Swedish. Not quite Norwegian and Danish, but Norwegian and Swedish. Let's go ahead and have a look and talk about the language. So before we begin, just a few points to consider. Biblical Aramaic, it's very short. It's less than 10 chapters. It's not the entire book of Daniel, nor is it the entire book of Ezra, but selections from those books, and really more in Daniel than in Ezra. Aramaic and Hebrew are cousin languages, as I just mentioned. If I were to tell you in German, mein Haus ist braun, you may have heard, if you're an English speaker, my house is brown. That's because the languages have the same roots. They're very similar, but they're also different. I mean, remember, the German word for speed limit is Geschwindigkeitbegrenzungen, and so we don't say that in English. And if I told you that, you'd be like, what the, are you talking about? Well, Arabic and Hebrew could be like that sometimes too, but I think they're closer than may maybe some of the comparisons I have here on the list. And I'll say, if you already know Hebrew, if you studied biblical Hebrew, Aramaic is really just a short jump. You have to learn a couple uh, hacks, I guess. And the, the kids today, they say hack, right? Yeah, it's cool. It's hip. Uh, you learn a couple language hacks and you can jump from Hebrew to Aramaic pretty simply. And the thing about biblical Aramaic that's great is it's really the gateway language to all the different Aramaic dialects that are out there, especially Syriac. You just have to learn a new font. But once you learn that, I mean, it's basically the same principles. So let's go ahead and compare a couple verses. We'll start with Daniel 2.7. Uh, and it reads in English, they answered the second time and said, let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will declare the interpretation. And so in Aramaic, that reads, now in Hebrew, we don't have that Hebrew in the book of Daniel, but we can approximate it, basically, uh, based on all the words we know from biblical Hebrew. Uh, so we'd say something like, So if you look closely here, uh, you can see, and I've kind of color-coded some of the specific differences. I'm only going to do that with this verse. But the first word is basically the same. The verb just takes different vowels in its conjugation. The verb is ani or anaya, uh, which in, in Hebrew is ana, third hey verb, to answer. Tinyanut versus shenit. So you have uh, ten versus shen. Pretty similar, very similar here. Omrin versus Omrim. So two things happening in this verse. Um, we have the different vowels, all long A in Aramaic for the participle, versus a holam, O in Hebrew, Omrin and Omrim. You'll notice the final consonant's different too. In Aramaic, you're going to see a nun. In Hebrew, you'll see a mim, na versus ma. Now looking at the next word, king. Malka versus Hamelik. So the root is the same, MLK. You can think of Martin Luther King if you want to remember the roots for king in Semitic languages. That works for Arabic too. You can say Malik. So Malka, the definite article is at the end, but in Hebrew it's at the beginning, Ham, Ha, Hamelik, right? Hamelik. Of course, we have the uh, direct object marker in Hebrew, et. We don't have it so much in Hebrew, but then again, that's my construction. Maybe you could do it differently. Chelma versus Hachalom. Hachalom. Again, we see the definite articles, and then we see the vowel changes. Yemar, Yomar, pretty much the same. Our verbs just change in terms of vowels, but the root is the same. Avdohi versus Lavadav. So the root is Avad for 
a servant, and here it's plural servants, so avadim versus avadin, um, the nun being the Aramaic, and of course the mim being the Hebrew. That's not present here because we have the 3ms ending. And if you look at the 3ms ending in Aramaic, ohi versus this final vav, now in Aramaic, fishra for the interpretation versus apitron in Hebrew. Usually we see the shin in Hebrew and the tav in Aramaic. And here it's the opposite, which is really weird. Uh, I took this word from the Hebrew from the book of Genesis. So if you're reading uh, the Joseph story in Genesis, it has dream interpretation, right? And so the word for interpretation there is the same. It's it's in the same context, which is why I chose this word, okay? Just to show kind of, you know, what how things are same and different. Um, and honestly, the, the Hebrew version looks more Aramaic than um, the Aramaic, the biblical Aramaic version to me. So there's probably something to that. And then finally, the last word um, in Aramaic, nehachewe versus nehewe. It's actually the same verb, but in Aramaic, it's in the C stem or the causative stem or what would be um, a hafel or the, you know, in, in in Hebrew, that would be a hifil, but the Hebrew here is pl. If you look below, it's pl, and that's the d stem or the doubled, the doppelstamm or the doubled stem. Now let's go ahead and just look at a chart, a comparative chart between the two, um, and we can take you know words from both languages that exist in both texts, and just see how some of the shifts happen. You know, we have um, the biblical Aramaic a for wood or beam, and it's in biblical Hebrew. So again, it's the ayin that's pretty much present there. And what probably happened with the biblical Aramaic, it would, would have been ayin ayin um, instead of ayin sade, um, as it is here in Hebrew. But, you know, that's kind of weird, a double ayin word. Um, so one probably alepticized, if I can say that. Not ellipticized, but alep, alepticized. The word gold in biblical Aramaic is the hav and in biblical hebrew it's zahav so the hav versus zahav that shift going on is a d versus a z what could be behind that what could well there is a letter i mean in english it's not a letter per se we use the th to make the sound but there's the sound the so the hub for gold that sounds kind of arabic doesn't it and you can see how it would move one way in biblical Aramaic and another way in Hebrew, D versus Z. Earth, Ara, and earth in biblical Hebrew, Eretz. Now, this is again the same, except there's that final shift that you see between an ayin and a salde. Uh, if you speak Arabic and you're listening, you may know this from ard, which is the ba sound for the salde. Now, when we talk about a sign in biblical Aramaic, we'll refer to it as an oath. And when we say it in biblical Hebrew, we'll say oath, oath. So the long A, um, Canaanite shifts to an O. Of course, long A's don't really happen as long A's anymore. They kind of just happen as, I don't know, common, common A's. Um, they work across the A spectrum. So ot, they would say probably, instead of ot. If you can hear the difference, props to you. Good, tov, versus biblical Hebrew, tov. Tov me'od, mazel tov, all these things, right? Biblical Aramaic is the same word, it's just tov with an A. Again, the tov and shin shift when we have yethiv, he sat, yethiv, versus yeshav in Hebrew. For silver or money, we have ksav. Or kesef, ksaf or kesef. Again, just different vowels in the same word. And by the way, as I'm saying the nouns here, I'm not using the emphatic form where we have the definite article at the end. I'm not saying kaspa or dahava or ara or atha, right? Or tava even. So I'm just using the absolutes because that that makes the comparison a little closer. And in biblical Hebrew, absolute forms are quite common. Finally, we have the word for tongue or language, lashon versus lashon. 
Now, you can probably get the hang of it after a while, right? You just kind of need time for your eyes to adjust. This is really a matter of shifting, adjusting. These are the hacks um, that help make biblical Aramaic accessible if you already know biblical Hebrew. So let's look at one last verse. I'm going to go word by word just to look at the differences. Here in English, it says, well, that's not what the English says. Never mind. The English says Artaxerxes, <laughs> Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, and so forth. And now, so this is Ezra 7 too. Uh, but the Aramaic reads, Artaxerxes, melek melekaya, Ezra kahna, safar datha di elash meya, gamir uchenet. Now we can basically render the same in Hebrew. Uh, there's only a couple words taken at the end from uh, other portions of the scripture. And your modern Hebrew might be a tiny bit different than this, but, you know, it's intelligible. So again, Now, if we just kind of go by, you know, word by word, um, the first two words, Artaxerxes is a name, and then Melech, king, in the absolute form, pretty much the same. Our plural forms are different. The king of kings, so Melech Melechia versus Melech Melachim. To Ezra, La Ezra is the same. Kahana versus Hakohen. Again, you know, that definite article movement. Safar versus Hasofel. So Safar um, is your Aramaic participle form versus the Hebrew participle. Again, see that shift, that long A to an O? It's present. Uh, datha, and I I put the preposition bet here for for Torah, uh, but datha versus Torah, right? So datha or Torah, and here I put it in the construct form, Torah, to take care of the next word in Aramaic, which is the, um, not going to use it in Hebrew. You could say shell in, in modern Hebrew in some forms of biblical, but... You know, the more common is Betorat. And in fact, if you look a couple of verses earlier in Ezra, that's exactly what you see. He's described as Hasofer Machia Betorat, right? And so Betorat Moshe um, in the Torah of Moses. Um, so the form, the forms are, you know, the forms are pretty much, this is pretty much how the forms would play out scripturally. And so this Datha, yeah, this is biblical Aramaic, but it's actually a Persian word. This is the Persian word for law. And, you know, those students of scripture um, know that Torah as law, yeah, that's that's how it's taken, but it also means instruction, right? And what's, what's really cool is by the time you get to, like spoken Hebrew today, if I want to refer to someone's religion, I'll call it Hadat. The, and so the Aramaic Datha, which is actually Persian, um, is used in the rabbinic and, and later modern period to refer to one's religion. You know, tradition, the adat. Uh, so it's pretty cool how how that's all evolved to be as it is. But you know, the the idea conveyed um, in the book of Ezra, at least, is something like the Torah is equivalent to the datha. Now, of course, the next word is the same: Ela for God versus El Elohe, which is just the construct form of Elohim. Shmeya versus Hashemayim, the heaven. Gemir, Gemir is um, here means and so forth. It means something like and it continues to the end. Can I think of it that way? The root means to end. You actually know it from <clears throat> you know it from Hebrew too. I mean, uh, Gamalnu, are we done? Right, Gamal. But in the Bible, you're probably going to see some in biblical Hebrew. You're probably going to see something like Vahala, Vahala, and this. This word just means and so on or or further or and beyond it, right? Uh, in modern Hebrew, you might do something like, you know, v'chen or uh, v'chen hala, something like that. Uh, modern speakers of Hebrew, you can chime in and, and render this. And anyone listening who does Arabic, um, how similar is it to, to what you know or what you would say? Now, our last word, our last word is uch'enet in Aramaic. In Hebrew is... Va'ata. So they're spelled the same um, if you look close enough. Now, Aramaic has a kaf at the beginning, which looks to have been affixed to the word after time, but um, it probably meant and now or and like now, as and and as now. So this ka is as or like. 
as now. And if you look at Enet versus Ata, you can see the Nun in the little Dagesh in that T, in the Tav there. So same words again. So you can kind of see how if you were from a different village or town, right? Like, you know, this might be intelligible. There's a certain set of vocabulary in this type of literature, and that makes sense. You know, this is uh, this is epistolary literature. It's correspondence literature. So, you know, we don't expect too much difference. Of course, they are different languages, so there is enough of a difference that, you know, between the two, you're not going to know um, anyone speaking modern Aramaic today and modern Hebrew. Yes, they're modern forms and not as close as the biblical forms, but you can pick out words here and there, but you know, they're different languages, especially in the modern period. But even back in the biblical period, they're different too. But, you know, you can you can kind of imagine how close they are and how maybe you don't know it at first, but you hang around your cousins, you know, or your extended family members in the next village or the next country or on the other side of the river or your ancestor community, right? The different tribe, how uh, after a while, it's not so bad, right? So, you know, this is how someone speaking Aramaic in ancient Jerusalem would not be understood by the masses, but maybe some of the elites it's one of the reasons why it's such an easy shift over time. So that's biblical Aramaic and biblical Hebrew. Use it as a gateway language, right? Like it's the, well, I can't use that comparison, even though it's legal now. Um, but it's a gateway language. You do Hebrew, and then all of a sudden you do biblical Aramaic. All of a sudden, you're open to all of these other Aramaic dialects. And biblical Aramaic is not that big. So once you get it, man, you can go back and forth between Hebrew or you can get into some other Aramaic languages. So that's it. I hope this is helpful and you use some of these hacks. If you're a student of biblical Hebrew and you want to learn Aramaic, get going because it's not it's not going to be too difficult once you get the hang of it. Once your eyes adjust, all of a sudden you have access to materials you may not have had otherwise. So And let me know if this was helpful or if there's any other items you think I may have missed that would be helpful in this conversation. Go ahead and post it for us.